Thank you uh, for being here. I see a lot of friends and uh, very friendly faces in the audience. Um, the uh, uh, topic RPC 2.0, um, I found especially over the last few days in having conversations with other people uh, here at Breakpoint, that phrase means different things to different people. Um, and it turns out that I picked the perfect panel for this discussion. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, uh, briefly from my left, uh, yeah, my left all the way down to the end. Uh, Max is here uh, from Mango Markets, and uh, Mango Markets has been working on an RPC 2.0 spec, mostly on high performance for DeFi and for traders. So um, uh, the, um, it's interesting because it's a different point of view than maybe some of the other folks have when we think about RPC 2.0. Um, Noah <laughs> is here because he likes to rant. Uh, and, and he's had some pretty good Twitter rants. So, um, and some are very much on topic about RPC 2.0. He brings a different perspective, which is more of a front end dev, uh, somebody who's trying to think more creatively about the applications that he's building and what he needs from the infrastructure layer. Um, and then finally, Nick uh, from Helios. Uh, he's the guy who actually does stuff at Helios. Um, and uh, so he's got an excellent background of, um, uh, you know, building up systems at large scale, uh, and then so he can help give us some extra balance and blending of, you know, can, can you actually build this thing, right? Um, and uh, so, so with that, um, the conversation that we're going to have is be, going to be extremely free flowing. Uh, we're going to start with a couple uh, uh, questions just to start the conversation, get things going, and once we go off on a tangent, I'm just going to let it roll. So. Um, so what I have then, I did bring some notes because I've got Noah's rant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can't reproduce that. It comes from the heart. Yeah, it, it does come from the heart, right. And so we're just going to take the, the tweet uh, thread uh, one at a time and, uh, and just have some fun with it. We're all, we're all here to have some fun. So tweet number one. DApps shouldn't need to run their own geyser, webhooks, and centralized Web 2.0 infra. What happened to the dream of writing a decentralized UI that anybody can deploy? It's a good start to a, a, you know, a rant, isn't it? Um, I do feel, uh, though, that we should probably just kind of do some level setting of, ex of definitions and things like that. Uh, Max, maybe you could start out, talk a little bit about like, what is geyser? And then we can all just kind of, you know, uh, have the basic context and then get more advanced from there. Yeah, Geyser was this, uh, I think, the big cure to uh, the initial issues with get program accounts. Remember in uh, 2021, everyone was having issues. We, we, we had to have a lot of nodes, RPC nodes in particular, to run these queries that can take up to three seconds. Um, can lock out the node completely, make it fall behind. And then the solution was, well, what if we could take every write to an account and stream it out of the validator into some other system and then run get program accounts on that cache right, of the original data. And uh, that system was first called, I think, AccountsDB plugin and then renamed to Geyser. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then over time, it has evolved, and there's more things you can get now. You can get the blocks. You can get, I think, also the transactions itself inside the block, um, and probably a few more things I'm not aware of, but uh, <laughs> that's the rough. Great, great, awesome. Um, webhooks, Mr. Webhook, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, webhooks, I mean, <clears throat> I can talk about two things, because I think first off, there's the so webhooks are a concept in software engineering, basically, where when data needs to be sent, like it's an event-driven architecture that where we push the data to a consumer, say, via like an HTTP post. There's also um, web sockets, which I think deserve a bit of a, to be brought up as well, which is another, mean of, another means of communication where you can push data. Uh, and the Solana API has some native um, web socket methods but one that's kind of recently been added through, um, powered actually indirectly by Geyser, is the uh, also the ability to do transaction web sockets. Um, so you could do either of those really when we're going back to the original um, 
tweet and the talk about DAS, which I think I'm sure we'll loop back to in a second. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely loop back to the, uh, the DAS API and how complex that is. Um, Noah, anything to add from your initial, that initial tweet there? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, so I, I came to Web3 from data infrastructure. So my job was all kind of deploying all this Web2 infrastructure, tons of pipelines. And it, it was beautiful when I came to Web3 because I was like, wait, I can just go and I can just write a front end. And it's not just using my stuff, it's using Bonfito's Nave service or uh, all these other things. And it was very composable. And anybody could just like go fork it and they could deploy it. And I was, I was really, you know, I loved that idea. And then Solana grew and the accounts grew. <laughs> and suddenly things like get program accounts just like, you know, stopped working. And then Geyser came out and it was, it was great because it was like now we actually can solve these problems. But, you know, I have now found myself very squarely back into the same hole that I had crawled out of from data <laughs> infrastructure, <Yep. laughs> which is beating data pipelines with a wrench again. Yep. And I had gotten out of being a plumber, and now I'm back. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. I, I distinctly remember those tipping points uh, from the very beginning when the account uh, DB was relatively small. And uh, then all of a sudden, um, uh, Serum is starting to take off, and the number of accounts that Serum had really started to explode, and performance just went straight down. And uh, it, was a, it was a beast to the point that we actually had to disable our, our, we would not index Serum for most servers unless it was a trader that, that actually needed Serum. Um, and, then, uh, and then soon thereafter comes Candy Machine and, um, and the exact same thing. And so that like a standard setup would be, okay, we're not indexing Serum, we're not indexing Candy Machine, and if you need that, it's special handling. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy how that happened. Um, let's see, let's go to the next tweet. Bites, bites everywhere. <laughs> it's do, like a poem. Do any ETH devs care about encoding schemes? Probably not. 99% of Solana projects are using Anchor with IDLs, and that defines the structs. Why bytes? Uh, can one of you guys be comfortable maybe uh, playing devil's advocate here? Why would it be better, or why do we have the bites, bites everywhere in the first place? Uh, Chesterson's fence, right? That there's, a fence exists for a reason. Why is it there? Um, why are we dealing with bytes? So do you guys want to? We're talking about in the context of GPA or? Um, yeah, just the idea that there's no advanced parsing layers happening with RPC right now. And uh, that you know, the results you get back is basically just base 64 or you know, whatever. I think it ties back to what we were just talking about with the size of the accounts, and right? So by having a byte structure and being, so the way that you query, you're querying by a byte offset, right? So you need to know the schema, but then it means that the actual way it works is now schemaless, it's easier to operate at scale, and it's, it's just, yeah, it's really the answer is it's easier, I think. So it, what it, what's happened is it's basically pushing the problem down to the consumer. Right, and I think that's why people like Noah are frustrated, right? Because they don't want to deal with that, but it, it works for now from that perspective, from our perspective, the pro RBC provider's perspective. Right. And even then, it doesn't really work that great, actually, so <laughs> it still hurts. I mean, if you ever developed an EVM, it's just like simulate is too slow, right? Because on EVM, you just send a simulation of a contract call and you get your parse data back mm -hmm. according to the uh, contract ABI mm -hmm. and uh, on like no one I think first there were no return codes for instructions mm -hmm. that was the first thing that had to be resolved right now there are return codes but no one's using them right yeah. um, but also if you were to simulate an instruction or transaction right that returns something it would just be completely slow mm -hmm. no one uses simulation at large scale and I think that's a uh, Right, that's a, that's a problem of RPC. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, uh, traders don't use simulations, right? Yeah. You, you lose too many milliseconds, you lose the ARB. Um, uh, then uh, uh, Jari Zhao had kind of, um, uh, he had replied, he said, I agreed with the sentiment, um, and, but he, uh, he thought that the RPC interface should always stay as raw as possible, which means bytes, um, and it gives you a more universal interface. Um, but let's kind of dig deeper into that then. So what would you add into the base RPC layer? Um, you know, how would we build that? 
Yeah, I think this is, this is always interesting, uh, especially when you talk to the people that are kind of around the, the core dev of Solana, because they very much want to focus on the hard problems, and they, 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 they want to stay out of user land as much as possible. Like, that's your problem. It, it's, it's all pushed downhill. Um, but like my, my start in development, I mean, way, way, way back when, was kind of in like Ruby on Rails land. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about Rails was like it, it actually took opinions on things. Like people were like, no, we're not going to be opinionated about everything. But Rails was like, actually, we are going to be opinionated about everything. We're going to take sane defaults that you can kind of break out of. And because of that, it was just an absolute joy to work with. Yep. Uh, it was very great to work with. Solana is very much on the, the other end of that, where it's, it's, it's not, because they haven't taken an opinion on everything. But in a weird sense, it kind of has. Like most people use Anchor. Most people are using abortion coding, for better or for worse. Um, most people don't publish their IDLs, but they should. And if they did, you could parse all of these accounts. And you can actually see this in the Solana Explorer. If you go like, look at Helium smart contracts, it's actually very easy to figure out what's happening with them because the IDL is there. But you know, we have people in the Helium community that have never touched Solana before. And you know, they're trying to get our accounts back and stuff. And especially if they're not working in JavaScript, like how do I parse this? What is this? What is a discriminator? Like what is what is this encoding? All of this is just um, crufts that people really shouldn't have to worry about. So I don't know exactly how you like implement this at RPC layer. Maybe there's a layer on top of the RPC. But if we actually start taking some opinions on things, uh, we can improve the developer experience, and we can get rid of things like get program accounts. It's like get program accounts, but if you add a, a variable length encoding, so now you have a vector. Uh, well, sorry, if you put anything after that vector, which, sorry, if you didn't know you were going to add a field to your account after the vector, sorry, you just can't filter on it. You're done. You're cooked. Um, I think if we get a little more opinionated, we can you know, make these things better. Right, right. Yeah, and in Rails, uh, they call that convention over configuration. And you just do it this way, and it will work. Um, and uh, it, there's probably more than a few, you know, rail devs or former rail devs in the in the. Yep, there you go. I am too. I, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I totally believe in convention over configuration. So maybe there's uh, maybe there's an opportunity to try and somehow, you know, get more of that spirit. Maybe even enforce it a little. Um, Nick, any thoughts on that? I think I agree with the sentiment, but. It's kind of like it's where do you draw the line on where you separate the boundary between like the platform layer or like if you make uh, an analogy to like the network stack, you have you know the various uh, various layers. So like if you like Rails very much is like almost like a toolkit, it's a framework, right? So we're talking about yeah, sure you have an opinionated framework, but should you have an opinionated RPC? Should you have an like mm, I'm not too sure. I'm not convinced. I think probably what you want is you want a richer anchor framework. You want stuff sitting on top of all this that gives you all that stuff. And then for every normal developer that wants to build an application, you're just using that. And it says, OK, here's how you do it. No, we'll never let you add a variable um, a field after a variable array. It just won't let you, right? if you choose to do that. And if you want to go hard mode and go raw, then yeah, you can do some stuff if you want. But uh, most people won't. Um, and that would, I think, behave very similar to Rails and give the same mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, is Noah, do you think that would be an optional layer that if let's say uh, Max and his team they they want to go hardcore and they're gonna they're gonna go for the bytes and just don't want any of this other stuff? Um, the problem is when you fork anchor. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah, when you when you start forking anchor and adding like variable length fields and stuff, support for variable length fields in your fork. Yeah, or you go like zero copy. Uh, yeah, and you use zero copy both. Yeah, yeah, it gets it gets real dicey real quick. It's it's very very interesting code I think, but uh, I didn't understand it. But I also wouldn't like everyone need to need to support that, right? Mm -hmm. We have like all these dynamic fields in the Mango account structure, and that's very specific parsing code that we use there. I it's, think that's fine, right? Yeah, like and that most people wouldn't need that. But if you use the IDL, you're gonna parse like 20% of the count, and the rest is garbage because yeah, and that's. that's Fine, right? Yeah. Convention over configuration. Like Rails very much like people who develop body will tell you, like, as soon as you start straying away from like the happy path, it starts fighting you. <laughs> like 
you're like, damn, this framework got hands. Like, <laughs> it, uh, and and that that's fine too. Solana can start fighting you. In fact, I I actually already developed this way on Anchor. When I like when I find myself in a situation where I I need to start using like zero copy or I have these giant accounts, usually I end up switching the design around such that I just have. Uh, more accounts or different accounts. Like usually, you get into the situations when you're storing like large arrays of data on accounts, and I find that that's you know because Solana acts like a NoSQL database where point queries are best. You're actually better off just adding more PDAs to the situation. Um, so I still think we can absolutely get away with it. And actually, I was listening to uh, the Explorers talk earlier, and Armani was there, and it's funny. He actually put in the original like Anchor IDL, you could put. Uh, an index into the macro uh, of account. You could say index this account, and it would put it in the IDL that you wanted this account indexed, and they eventually removed that. But that was the spirit. Like, he knew when he designed it, and he's very, very good at like kind of understanding what makes things easier for devs and kind of cutting out that cruft. And he knew. He was like, yeah, this is, this is what we need. We need like a clean indexed version. Um, and actually, there are startups on Solana you know, working on this problem, but uh, then you have to worry about vendor lock-in. Uh, and what happens if that startup dies and things like that. Um, so there's something very beautiful about, you know, we talk about not doing this and we want to stay raw and we want to stay in the bytes, but like the digital asset API, DOS, is beautiful. It is a work of art and it runs on all the major RPCs and it's a pleasure to use and it is very opinionated, but it's great. And I'm just saying like, just, just do that for all the accounts. Do it for everything. Make my life easier. <laughs> yep. Uh, but if you're building for a particular program, though, uh, for Helium, do you actually care about all the other programs? Or do you really just need to focus in on your own? It depends if you compose with them, right? Like, if you compose with switchboards, you maybe care about the switchboard accounts. Mm -hmm. um, the big example is, like, all of our hotspots are, are NFTs, um, and so they need to compose with Bubblegum, and we actually attach, like, PDAs on top of these NFTs so that we can put on-chain uh, metadata on there. Um, but then this is actually a problem that we, you know, we end up you know, putting our plumber hat on and actually running indexers for, uh, which is like, what if I want to get you know, all, of the, you know, all of the NFTs in a given wallet with their associated on-chain metadata? That's now a join from my program to somebody else's program. Right, right. Um, and you can, yeah, you can, you know, say with these things, well, sure, you've, you know, you're helium, you're, you're huge. Of course, you've gotten into these horrible, complex use cases. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Maybe that's the answer yeah, yeah. that we go with. But right. I, I think, you know, more and more, you're going to see these indie dev teams that just, they want to build a UI and have it deploy anywhere. And it's so much easier for them if they don't have to do the DevOps work, mm -hmm. if we've, you know, got this stuff figured out. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll let Nick respond to this one. Uh, we're going to go on to the next tweet. Oh, God. <laughs> this, one, this one, I'll use an angry voice. I'm not sure if that's what you intended, um, but it might be good drama. I hadn't had my coffee, so. <laughs> oh, okay. A little, a little very angry. angry. Okay, maybe a little hangry. <laughs> yeah. If you just decoded accounts on a program with a well defined IDL and provide a nice API over these accounts, you'd remove all GPA use cases and most custom indexer use cases. Nick, how would you deploy that? How would you build that? Well, I think the first clarification I want to ask, and maybe I don't know if that's if your Do thoughts it. on this have changed, is are you looking to have indices on the properties of like your, um, like your schema, essentially? So like your data model, like actually application-specific indices that you can query. That's very different from the current GPA. Yeah, like let's say you know you're building like a governance module, right? And you have uh, proposals on it, mm -hmm. uh, and those proposals have names. Like if you just want to do a simple query, like you would do in Postgres, like an I like, I want proposals that have a name like this, right? There's just there is literally no way to do that on Solana right now. Not yeah. possible on Solana, NPOS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean searchability, right? Like. Just being able to like index a field, a text field, and search in it yeah. is, a, is like a common feature in front end. Um, right now, everyone just downloads all the possible accounts they want to search through, and then does that client side, right? Yeah. Which is, and then someone's I mean, like, why is my phone bill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think if you want to load realms, it's something like 16 megabytes of data for MangoDAO. 
just oh, to vote. So you cannot really vote on 3G. <laughs> yeah. You need at least 4G. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I, I agree that there is a I, the, this having a proper querying API, API is extremely difficult to specify um, before you know all the use cases. Uh, I think I remember the first time I saw the MongoDB like basically query API. I was very impressed that these guys managed to take something that you know there was a standard called SQL. Everyone was using it, and they were like bold enough to bring their own. Um, and it was, I, I think there are some use cases that are really hard to express, right? Once you go out of the um, declarative space. Um, and so I, I try to have a similar, you know, like very reduced query API for the event spec that I wrote. And you just get into a lot of edge cases that you cannot express, right? Like some things, um, I don't know, give some queries, we, we really like looked at it and we're like, okay, can we do this query? Can we do that query? Can we do that one, right? All these things that are currently running on like custom SQL caches, right? Basically. Um, and I would, I would like that we, we can get a discourse going and come up with something that, that makes universal sense, right? Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what the, even the starting point for that would be. Is this, do we want to take something like MongoDB Security language? Do we want to roll our own? Do we want to support full SQL? Um, I mean, I mean, what we've done for Helium is we just literally take Helios webhooks, decode the accounts, uh, and insert them straight into a Postgres table. It actually works disgustingly well. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a startup called Vibe that actually they did this, um, and they presented like a GraphQL API uh, on top of it, <coughs> and it was fantastic. I actually don't know where they stopped. It was probably just like they weren't, you know, able to do the business development to get enough teams to, to use it. Or, you know, I, I've also been wrong many times before. It could, could be I'm just wrong. And this is, you know, the way I'm designing things, I need this occasionally, but other people don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. There, there's one danger, um, kind of my hot take on indexing in particular, like, uh, you know, uh, Armani allowing for an index, you know, index this attribute statement. Um, my hot take is this. Most devs don't know how to build a proper database index. Oh, yeah. And then we end up with a situation where we've got people pushing that into production, but they don't realize how much damage they just caused on the back end. And um, they don't have to pay the cost of that, right? Somebody else does. They point at Nick or they point at me and say, you suck or I suck. Um, you've been there before, I know. Um, <laughs> everybody blames the RPC. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that, that's, that's going to be hard to solve um, is, you know, somebody in the middle to say, wait a minute, that's a really bad way to do this. Um, yeah, I think what we're missing, right, is, and this is maybe a little bit crazy, but crypto, right, it's all about incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and the incentive model there is completely messed up because I can, you know, push crap downhill and just completely overload the RPC. Right. Right. But what if... You know, we, we somehow made it so that reads also had a cost, and if you have some horrible, horrible thing that you're indexing that is expensive to read, you're paying for that. Um, that would be cool. I think, I think there's like a, I think the graph on Ethereum does something like this, but I haven't dug too deep into it. Yeah, I, I haven't either. Yeah, in, in Fura has credits. I mean, um, I think I'm sure you can buy them with MetaMask somehow, but... Yeah, like <laughs> classical web two credits, right? Um, and um, yeah, you need to optimize your. You need to start using all these weird. I don't know. Multi call is a very popular one. Um, so when I when I build like you know Oracle infrastructure or things like that, where we need to query Ethereum endpoints over RPC, I'm always also surprised by how, how much like inside knowledge you need how experienced you need to be to do very simple things like, you know, I just want to know the price of rap Bitcoin versus ETH on Uniswap V3. Um, and I, I would like for us to like, kind of foresee those things a little bit, right? Like from a, and from a standard point, like come up with something that is actually both deployable, but then also generic enough for, for, for people to use. Um, I'm very, like, once you go into this, like, question of indexing, for me, the biggest cost is, uh, at least, on, like, indexing what, right? Because 
in theory, you can run a query without any special purpose index, but it might be very slow. That's basically what we have right now with like GPA and filter, right? Yep. Um, that just runs in linear time over accounts DB and tries to find all accounts that match the description. Uh, if you want the you know O log n lookup, for instance, right, or a faster search query with a pre-made index, you need to aggregate that data. You need to store that index data somewhere, which usually is roughly the same size as the data you're you're searching on, right? All right. And and so the more of those search indices you have, the more data you actually need to aggregate, sort through, and and store. And so. It, I think two RPC providers might not have the same index, right? So this then brings up the, for me, that makes sense in some way, right, to say, well, my application runs everywhere. Um, if I run it on a public RPC, it will probably be horribly slow, um, or be rate limited, and will not even work at all. Um, right, there might be too many errors. Uh, or I work with a custom indexing provider, then it has the same API at least. That's, like I think that's we, we utterly failed if they will be different. Um, so we should make sure it has the same API. But then also that we have different offerings uh, that target to the most common use cases, and we have recipes for people to set that up. I think 99% of the developers want to have for the application some form of indexing on some form of NFT collection. <laughs> like usually, they want to have all the accounts owned by a certain program, and they want to have all the token accounts of the respective wallet or user that's interacting with their program or never interacted with their program. And those are the most common queries, and we know the token program, uh, the token owner lookup is actually already in the validator as a special purpose index, right? So there is a, I'd say, strong indication that this is something most people want to have. Once we have a way to easily set up the same index in RPC2, right, outside the validator, we should be able to remove that from the code, make the validator faster, um, which is the part I'm so excited about there, actually, right? Like, we want to get it, at the same time, make it more feature complete um, so that people can actually, I remember we had this discussion, we were like, hey, should we just fork the validator and put another index in <laughs> for GPAs on the Mango program? <laughs> like, why don't we do that? And I, I remember I proposed this to Solana, like, why don't we add a command line flag for like the user index? And people were like, oh my god, no. <laughs> yeah, probably throws out of control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't yeah. stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I like it though. Like that's that's yeah. great. Like you define an API, it's gonna be the same API. And actually this already happens with GPA. If you like hit the public RPC with an unindexed GPA, it's gonna suck but then you go to Triton and they can index it for you. But it's the same API, so you can still, you still have the dream. You can still deploy the code once and everywhere. Um, and it also works really, really well for small startups. Like, it doesn't, like, if you have, you know, a couple hundred users, your thing doesn't need to be indexed. Right. It, can be a, it can be a range query, but, like, if it has an API that's querying on well-structured data on a well-structured field and not just bytes, that's good. And if you're doing crazy, crazy stuff, like you, you know, probably eventually have, like you, yeah, you're gonna have to run your own geyser and, you know, or webhooks and index it. But we can probably solve for 99% of these use cases. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I want to give uh, Nick a chance to uh, to jump in here, um, and let me um, let me do this. So I'll I'll read you some comments I had from Steve Lusher earlier today. Um, he's emceeing over at a different stage, so I asked him ahead of time if he uh, had any comments for this particular panel. Um, and um, so the thing that he said that he's most passionate about is uh, what RPC will look like at the outer edge. And I uh, said, Joe from Labs has written a GraphQL schema uh, to the network to answer the question. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, that I had asked the question, what would the ideal API look like? He thinks that's Graph. QL, um, and uh, that they actually wrote that to uh, ride on top of the existing JSON RPC API. 
Um, so um, I don't know if the, any any comments of that or if, um, uh, yeah, I keep getting riff however you want to. Riff <laughs> I keep on getting that. the ones I don't agree with, really. All um, right, great, funny. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna be the contrarian here. Um, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of GraphQL to begin with. I get why people like it, especially front end devs. And, and for people who don't know, Stephen Lusher, he, he's yeah. the author of Web3.js, uh, so it's a you know TypeScript library. Um, GraphQL, the way it works is that you can basically get a bunch of different data in one spot with one kind of query, but it allows people to do some pretty crazy stuff. If you're thinking RPCs with GraphQL against my server, it's like, oof, no, that's scary. <laughs> right? You could like nest stuff. You can nest data, and it's going to result I in would never. Obscene, insane queries. So like, I think I agree with the principle that people are going to want that. And the way to do it, though, is it's about having a way to pull the data into some sort of like indexed state where then you can actually have optimized GraphQL queries running against that instead. So it's like, how do we build the tooling to let people actually construct that and hold it there instead of having GraphQL converting into like the existing RPC sort of like queries, and then that would just be a disaster. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean someone wants to like have it be an intermediary layer where you hit the GraphQL and then it forms like a GPA? And yeah. That's the, yeah. Oh. That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, that's exactly. Terrifying. Yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> Just like one call making thousands of GPA calls. Yeah. Yeah. What I would love is like if it was actually well indexed data so you could, you know, go and make the graph. Exactly. So we were talking all about like how do we build these indexes, right? And it's like we talked about, say, like, you know, Trident has there, you can, oh, index this field for me. So if we're talking about structured data, then and GPA already acts like a filter. So you could have structured data with a filter. That's pretty easy to do generally, right? Like you can have, that's really just you have your anchor IDL, and then you have then you have the structures, so you can filter. And then if you want something optimized, then yeah, you have an index. And that, that, I think, works. But then if you want to go even more complicated, it's about how do we set up common tooling to pull the data somewhere else and then build a query of, say, a GraphQL API. And that, that also talks about things like GRP streaming tools or other sort of ways we can kind of have that sort of common interface to stream it out. And then maybe it's also how do you run that locally as a developer? How do you run it yourself in a smaller mode? Like, it, it shouldn't have to always depend on Helios or Triton. If you wanted to use that GraphQL API, it's only us two that offer it. Well, then now you kind of have like some form of vendor lock-in, which I guess is somewhat good for me, I suppose. But like long-term, it isn't. So we have to think about like aligning the incentives long-term. Yeah. Are, are there? Um, are there? Let's think for a moment about going the other way too. So we're we're talking about doing things at scale and trying to get performance at scale, but. If we bring this down to localhost, and uh, and Dev is you know just you know working in a localhost environment, is this stuff going to be easy to set up, and you know run it on your laptop and expect that it's just going to work once you push it to production? Didn't happen with us. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. Oh, really? I think it, I think it could be. Yeah. Like okay. the like if you're running say. Even if you're running a, your own validator or say you're doing something on local net, you could have like a SQLite database. And as long as there's some sort of like open source tooling to kind of go, and it'd be the same core packages. That's the thing. It's just about like, what is it pushing it to? If it's just pushing it over localhost to your own SQLite database, then that should behave in principle the same way. And the, the only ways that's going to behave differently is the problems of scale but if you don't want to deal with that, then you throw that at us, and we'll take care of that. That's really our job, like Helios and Trident, is just to deal with the painful scale stuff so you don't have to. But locally, it should absolutely work, yeah. I think there's a, like, like every, very early internet times, where we had this thing called the LAMP stack. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that, yeah. Like, I think it, like something like that, right? Like very basic package is enough. Yep. Um, I mean, if people want scaffolding and, I don't know, setting up index or configurations when they create a new account type and anchor. And that sounds like a Rails style mm -hmm. um, yep. kind of development workflow, maybe, that we want to lay on top. But for, yeah, for the beginning, I think in the testing phase and initial development phase, we can probably run with a LAMP style. Right, right. Set up. Yeah, I mean, that, that really does feel like it needs to be a requirement no matter what, right? No matter what we do with RPC 2.0, that we have to be able to run it on localhost and then know that the modules are going to behave the same once we throw it up into production. 
even if it's running SQL Lite locally or, or, or Postgres or whatever, right? It's still going to behave the same. Yeah. yeah, there's really like three stages of development, at least for me. I know my brother just pushes straight to mainnet, but for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's the guy we're afraid of. Yeah, exactly. He's just like, send it. Uh, but for me, like I start, I develop things on localhost. Uh, I make it. Run, I run tests against it, um, and things need to work in localhost. And then there's a stage after that. You're running it on DevNet, um, and man, so many developer tooling companies just like forget about DevNet. Uh, like, well, why aren't you just using mainnet for it? Yeah. Um, and then you finally go to mainnet. But this like you know mirrors like somebody working on a startup, right? Like they're gonna start localhost, just messing around with it. Maybe they haven't even raised funds yet. So obviously they're not going to be paying an expensive like RPC to index this stuff, but it doesn't matter. They've got a few tens of records. And then you get the DevNet, um, or even maybe MainNet, but they don't have that many users so they can use like the public RPC. And then finally, when they've like proven they have a little bit of PMF, then they can pay for the RPC to have the indexing. But as long as the API stayed the same the whole time, it's perfect. Yeah, 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 for sure. Maybe that's also, I remember we started, there was like the public one, then there was Project Serum, like you could ask to get like access to it with your DAP. And I think they were running an absurd amount of RPC nodes. And then at some point you would outscale that as well. And then I remember I contacted Marco or something. Yep. He was running the, in his basement here in Amsterdam yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah Mark, yeah, in Rotterdam, and he has a, uh, and, and this is cool, by the way. Talk about Max Nerd. There he is right there. There's Marco. He's got a data center in his house with a one gigabit fiber connection. And uh, um, he also DDoSed himself once, I remember, in the early days of Solana, and his kids were pissed because they couldn't game. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was um, that, that was definitely crazy having to deal with the way that that, that scaled and the issues there. Um, let's see, we've got a boy only a few minutes left. Um, uh, this has gone quickly, so let, let's jump ahead a little bit. Um, going back to Nick, um, let's start to talk a little bit about DOS API and account compression indexing in general. Um, could you give people a sense of how difficult that was? to bring that up and how difficult it is to run it. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Um, and I, I think like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues with it, but we're, we're kind of, you're adding an extra layer of complexity over the same pains you've already talked about as soon as you go into compression, because in compression, what you're doing is that when instead of just indexing the current state of accounts, you can never recover that by saying what do accounts look like. You have to go back traverse the whole ledger and reconstruct our current state. And then if you have problems, you have to find a way to look back and be like, it's not easy to figure out what's missing, especially when with compression, everything's all hashed and by nature, hashes are not you know, feasibly reversible. So, so yeah, it's quite challenging. And, and to add to that too, when you're talking about DAS, you're actually going one layer up the stack even further. So we have compression in there, but now we're also talking about like almost like an application or your user space, you could say, because you're talking about now like NFTs, right? Um, and how they behave, and, and, and actually metadata as well. So like collections, creators, all the rules around that. So all that's all tied together, and all of it can break each other. So I, I personally don't love that model. I think that um, it's the same sort of things we're talking about here. It's about just building out the right layers on top of each other. So if you make a, I would like to see, and there's work that's going to happen here, on basically making compression just easier to use in general the core kind of components just handled sort of for you. And then that way, when you're in your user space, you can just build at the user space and not have to worry about like what's a Merkle tree and how do I deal with that and how do I recover my data when I've missed X transaction. Like, you shouldn't have to worry about those things. Yeah, yeah, and then, um, and like you said, the, to be able to bring that back down to localhost too, and then know that um, that you can run locally a, a version of DOS API that's only for you know the, just that limited test data set that you're working on. Um, definitely hard. We've got less than a minute left. Um, maybe we'll do just real quick. Uh, uh, boy, what do we want to do? Uh, just super quick thoughts on. What, how long is this going to take to build? What do you think? A year, more than a year, really quick. We've only got 30 seconds. So. Um, 
I mean, all the extra API fluff on top, I don't think there's any timeline on that. We're happy to hear your input. Um, for the like basics that I'm looking at right now, I think it's maybe six to 12 months for an initial rewrite of RPC. Mm -hmm. OK. No? I think it depends on how much discussion you want to do. If you want to do proposals and proper discussions and community forums, it's going to take five years. If you want to shove like five devs into a basement and force them to code it, mm -hmm. maybe you could do it in six months. Okay. But it probably wouldn't be the best API. So okay. yeah, you got to get trade-offs. Sounds like the Solana ethos there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Solana really does love the shoving, shove some <laughs> yeah, devs yeah. in a basement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Nick, final word. We're out of time, but I'll give you the final word. I think pretty similar. I think uh, maybe six months, but again, it's going to be a bunch of phases. So I think we just have to break it up into phases and knock one at a time. And I think all those phases, what we're really envisioning, yeah, we're probably looking more at the past one year mark to have like the dream Great. we're talking about. Yeah. Nice. What do you think, guys? Good job. <laughs> Thank you.